G'day, welcome back to Project Brewpeg, story of a sunken fishing trawler converting into a global expedition and research boat. Today, we have a productive sit down. We do a bit of pad welding, we cut some wood, we join some metal, and we sweep up some of the last jobs. One of the challenges that Scott and I had the other day when we were sandblasting is the sandblaster, after a while, it starts to chew out most of the metal parts on it because it was never designed to be sort of potted up the way that we have. So sandblasters are always pretty hard on gear and pipes and things like this. This is one of the pipes that used to go from that fitting down the bottom there. Um, this is just an air line, so it's only air that runs through. However, you can see that, that's pretty normal on these pipes. They, they chew out, they, they go hard, they wear out, etc. We're going to replace it with some really hardcore reinforced um, fuel line. The reason being this will also die, but it's cheap. I don't need to put any swaged fittings onto it. I can just, just use a hose tail um, and it means that I can yeah, basically just replace this whenever I need to. So gradually as we use this machine we upgrade the parts so that it's more and more um, fixable. These ball valves, we go through those probably once every three months. You can see this one's already starting to fall apart. Um, that's pretty standard. So uh, yeah, if you buy one of these, don't expect it to be a, a machine for life. You're going to be repairing it for life basically to keep them running. This here is a perfectly good hose tail that was on the machine on one side. So that happened. Um, that's fairly frequent, that sort of stuff going on on the machine. And that was the bit that, was, um, that delivers the sand from the red tank down the line towards the gun. Um, so what I've done, it used to weld onto the end of this little piece here, but I've gone and welded this great big fitting on so that we can screw in every time it chews one out, we can just swap it over and screw it in. So more fixable, basically. I haven't stopped the problem, but I've just made it easy to deal with the problem. The other thing it does is destroys ball valves. So if you can see down that ball valve there, I don't know if it's gonna show it, but the little Teflon sort of ceiling face that they have, they just chew out in a matter of nanoseconds um, because these ball valves don't sit fully open or fully closed. They sit like, I don't know, 10% open, something like that. This one normally sits about there. And as such, you can sort of see, try and get a bit of light down there. You see that hole? It doesn't fully, you know, open all the way through. So the sand just annihilates them. So these ball valves, even though they're 316, they last, I don't know, three months. I'd love to find a solution for that, but I don't know what it is. If you can think of something, let me know in the comments. These older style bronze nozzles here don't really last either. You can see there's a hole coming through the actual um, outlet on the, on the nozzle itself. Um, and you can also see the ceramic on the inside is chewing out sideways. That's not supposed to happen. That's supposed to be uniform. So this is what the inside ended up looking like. So that's a ceramic cone that should be in there. And you can just see most of it's disappeared. There's a hole over on that side going right through the bronze. There was a black rubber o-ring that sealed everything up that's just disintegrated. Um, these are pretty sturdy. They last about a year normally and this one chewed out in, oh, I don't know, two weeks. And as you've previously seen, this is the new upgraded nozzle that we're going to use on our machine. Today we're going to be welding a piece of 316 stainless onto some mild steel. Now, it's really critical whenever you're joining these two metals to make sure that they're perfectly clean. So I've gone around the edge with a grinder. Just given that a clean up. I've taken all of the galvanizing off because we don't want any of that getting into the weld. It will mess the weld up. And I've also cleaned this face as well as this face here on the stainless. They're going to be joining like that. So there's plenty of room around that fitting to put a nice chunky bead. Now, it's really critical when you're welding stainless and uh, or any metal for that matter is to make sure your surfaces are clean because that um, stops rubbish going into the weld and creating porosity or cracks or anything like that that's going to give you grief later on. It takes you two minutes and it's the difference between a, a good weld and a bit of an average weld. Now, when you're welding mild steel to stainless, the most important thing is the filler rod that you use. I'm going to be TIG welding, um, so this is what a uh, TIG welding rod looks like, it's just a straight piece of metal. This is 309 stainless, and that's the stuff that you need to use to join mild to stainless. It bonds between the two metals and doesn't allow any sort of cracks and, and carry on like that. Now, if you're doing stick welding, it's exactly the same, except it's a 309 rod with flux on the outside. If you're using MIG, it's 309 uh, wire, with, and you use argon for both TIG and MIG if you're doing stainless. So you don't want to have any oxygen in, um, in your gas, because that way you'll end up with a bit of um, uh, oxidation in the weld. You'll end up with a, a bit of a grey, horrible-looking weld. 
Um, same deal with CO2. You can't use CO2 when you're welding um, anything but carbon steel, basically. So uh, CO2 affects stainless when you weld it. So straight argon, and that's all you need to do. Going to do a couple of tack welds and then we'll spin it over and do a nice weld around the back. Okay. Now, if you can see down in there, you've got nice sort of stainless coloured welds. That just a couple of tacks, I didn't put any filler rod in, that's just melting the stainless onto the mild steel. Because I'm using argon, I haven't got any discoloration and I haven't got any funny um, marks or anything like that going on and that's because there's no oxidation in what I've just done. If I was using a different gas or if I had poor shielding of my argon, um, then I would end up with blues and all sorts of other colours. Um, they look pretty, but it does mean that you're not getting as good a weld as what you'd like to get. couple of colors to look for. This blue color here, there's a little bit of blue there. That basically means I'm not getting enough coverage with my argon, so I need to che either change the nozzle or change my technique. This brown color here is, is what you want. So brown is, is a good color, it's a good heat. It also shows that there's no oxidation in there. So I'm just gonna carry on going around and hopefully improve my technique and get rid of this blue. This is the same weld, I've just gone around and given it a clean up in the buff wheel just to take off any surface discoloration. Now, you can sort of see here I've got a reasonable weld. It's not my best work, but it's good enough for what this is, it's just a sandblaster attachment. Around here, you sort of see here you've got all these little pits and pores and marks and things like that in the weld. And what that was is a little bit of rubbish got into the weld, so there was a sticker down here. Some of it burnt off and got into the actual weld itself. And that's why it's so critical to make sure that you've got really, really clean steel when you start to weld. She's back together, and after a disproportionate amount of swearing, I managed to get this black pipe here onto the two hose barbs. Doing a big stretch? Yeah. Oh, what a cutie. Love you. Yeah. Maybe she's doing cat yoga. Maybe. Bazinga, we have a sandblaster. So it's working an absolute treat, nice rough surface, perfect for paint. Uh, the new nozzle is a really smooth blast when you're using it. Um, the old nozzle used to pulse and bounce around and throw sand and it was a bit of a mess, but this is just really awesome to use.
Jesus carpet, it's gonna be so pissed. Sandblasted today, that we sandblasted yesterday morning, and then that we sandblasted with Scott the other day. But that is a galley taken down the middle. This morning's job, we need to get in and of. Can you see that orange steel there? That's basically stuff that I've um, re-blasted just to be absolutely certain that there's no rust kill or anything like that on it. There's no other contaminants. I need to get in and um, pad weld that. So that's an area along. Uh, basically the join between the deck and the hull and on the other side of that is the sponson so we're not going to be welding where we'll be able to see burnt off paint we're welding essentially on the inside of the sponson um, but there has been corrosion in the past and we have lost a bit of metal thickness there so I want to deal with that if you don't know what pad welding is um, it's a simple way of basically increasing the thickness of a piece of steel that has very localized corrosion so in this case we've got a six millimeter plate of steel and it's lost about three millimeters, four millimeters maybe of, um, of thickness. So it's only a couple of mil thick, way too thin for what we want. We want something nice and strong, at least six mil. So you normally build it up higher than the original plate. So 
Um, sometimes you'll go to say 10 millimeters, put just plenty of steel in there. What you do is you get a MIG welder and you just basically buzz over the area um, and, and fill it up, just literally pour steel in there until you've got plenty of thickness and you've got a nice bond between all areas. Some people have a heart attack when you hear about pad welding. They think you should cut the steel out and replace it. But if you cut the steel out, you end up with more potential weaknesses than if you pad weld it properly. Um, pad welding is a completely standard process in the commercial world. Um, it's normal to pad weld. It's abnormal to replace a panel if you don't need to replace a panel. Um, so yeah, just um, something to bear in mind when you're looking at repairing corrosion on your steel boat. I'm blowing holes down in the corner. Now pad welding by its very nature means that you're welding steel that's very thin. Sometimes you don't necessarily know how thick it is because you obviously don't you know, drill through it and test the thickness or anything like that. In this case I'm blowing holes. Easiest way to deal with that is just to slow the machine down, take a bit of amperage out of it, a bit of heat and a bit of wire feed. Um, it doesn't matter how long it takes to do pad welding because it's, it's infinitely faster than replacing the panel. Um, and if you blow through it, it's not a big deal, you just need to fill it back up with metal. Remember, you're basically melting liquid metal and you're liquefying the metal around it, so it becomes as permanent a bond as what the original panel used to be. There you have it. So that's basically a pad welded join. So there's plenty of uh, steel left in there now. In fact, there's a tiny bit of undercut. You know what, I'm gonna run another bead on that kind of the beauty of pad welding is you just keep throwing steel at it if you're not happy like here I don't know if that's thick enough to be honest I'm gonna add a bit more and I'll come up and over the original corrosion um, and yeah just keep adding steel you can sort of see down the back there there's bucket loads where the corrosion was um, and that's probably going to be close to 10 mil thick now that'll be pretty chunky especially down in here that's all solid steel that'll be probably at least half an inch thick so yeah simple fast way of fixing localized corrosion There you have it, pad welding. So let me show you right down, right down close. So you can sort of see, it's quite bulbous. I actually went over, let's get the light out. I went over this one again. You can sort of see where I went over that black sort of line at the top, that's the flux. Um, basically did a, a second run right across the top. I wasn't fully happy with that. So what we need to do now is quite a lot of flux and bits and pieces on top of that weld. Now there's a very good reason why I've used flux core weld uh, wire in this setting. Um, normally you wouldn't need to, being inside the boat, there's no wind, there's nothing to, you know, to deal with in that sense. But I've used flux core because the steel was a little bit rusty, and flux core brings all of that rust and gunk and stuff to the surface of the weld so that when you weld, you get a really crisp weld, but you also get all of the contamination floats to the top of the weld and you can just get rid of it afterwards. Um, so what I need to do now is come in just and spot blast those little areas there um, get rid of the flux uh, from the top of the weld, clean it off back down to a paintable surface, and then we'll get some rust kill. You can already see I've started rust killing. That rib is black versus a golden rib just here. That's the difference between the two once you've got the, the layers on. So from that line there, everything that way has had two coats of uh, rust kill, and then everything that line that way has had one and you can sort of see the difference between them it's pretty clear and obvious I actually gave that one there a bit of a squirt yesterday so that's had two this gives you an idea like it's just with a spray bottle and you can get it to pick it up it's incredibly easy to put this stuff on and it leaves you with a really good bond against the steel because it chemically joins with the steel so it's pretty awesome So we'll get this done and then we'll get our two pack onto this. Job we have to do before we can paint. This floor has been rust killed. That's a raw rust kill finish. It goes that kind of black color where you get this crystalline structure on the surface. We need to go through with a wire brush.
give it a raz up like that. Now, probably 50% of the rust kill disappears when you do this, but um, it takes all the crystalline structure off and it leaves you with an amazing finish to paint onto. Um, this is what we've been doing for a few years on brew peg, and the paint holds really well when we do that. If we don't do that and we just paint on that, paint doesn't last. I was never the one to write up a song for just anyone. I, I was always the one to find myself lost in all conversations. Of... We've got a few jobs on this morning, so. We're drying some more sand. We've got most of those buckets full. and We're just about probably halfway through our sand pile there. Down the back, I've got some timber. While it's cold, I've got some timber out. Um, we're chopping up the shape, so this needs to be split down the middle. That's gonna form the main plinth that the cabinets and bench sit on. That's a piece that I cut out. Um, you can sort of see the big weird shape that I cut out of the side there. That was for um, a storage unit in the starboard cabin. We're gonna cut um, some strips so that we can make some fiddles and things for the shelves around this side. We're gonna have a clean up of this soon, apparently, according to Jess. There's a lot of sentimental memories in that pile. I don't really want to, but it turns out we have to. We've been digging all of the sand. This is from years ago. That was uh, water tanks that got blasted. This is all the recent blasting, the white sand on top. We've cleaned out this area. This was a big pile of sand. You can see this chocker full of sand and water at the moment. That has to be dug out because we're getting rid of it. Um, so this is what we've dug out so far. I think this is a three metre skip, three metre square metre skip, or 180 foot pounds, I think, if you go imperial. Uh, yeah, so that's been hand shoveled into the skip so that we can get rid of it, so that we're starting to clean the bottom of the boat out ready for launch. So I'm, I'm working in here doing like the light, delicate, fiddly work. <laughs> and I'm working in here emptying it out ready for blasting. Like a she-beast. <laughs> Doing the grunt work. You know, like, like the heavy objects. <laughs> <laughs> so in this end of the cabin, what I'm building is this. So you can sort of see this is the wardrobe part that is there. And we're going to start doing some shelves going across this area here. I just want to show you a very technical Thing that Damien does, it's really awesome. Very technical, very professional. I don't like where this is going. <laughs> you see that bottle top over there? <laughs> That's a measury thing. It's a very specific measury thing. Was it just the right height or something? Well, it was right there, more than anything else. <laughs> so now it's that height. That's how high we're having it off that <laughs> corner. Yeah. I think that's called opportunist. Yeah. <laughs> so you're doing well. Do you know? You've almost finished there. Layer. The cutting, have you? Oh, I've got a wee bit of shaping and trimming to do, but I've kind of got to get the basic shape of it done so I can figure out where I need to cut the... It's, the, thing I'm, the thing that takes the time is over on that far side, everything's a weird angle. Yeah, look so at that. Yeah. You've got two angles that way, plus you've got the angle of the hull, so yeah. in that direction as well, so the slope. to get everything to line up, it's a bit of a weird thing to sort out. So. Oh, you've done well. Yeah. It, it doesn't look like it's a lot of space, but for a boat, that's a big space, it's a big locker. Yeah. Well, so. One of, one of the things I have to take account of is where the insulation goes. I have to take that line down and meet, find out exactly where it meets here, um, and then join that right the way along the front, so that's where the top edge, um, so that it'll be a smooth transition from the wall panel into the um, into the top of the shelf um, and the top of the wardrobe. So um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm almost up to that part now. If you just want to pan round here, just show the guys the the, uh, the galley at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, this is our galley, so um, we have one shelf <laughs> to work with. Um, making my normal muesli, I, put, I, I um, oven bake my muesli, so the oven is out on the back deck, and whether I've got power or not, depending on what's happening on the work on the boat, that just something as simple as that becomes a real problem. I put a roast in the oven this morning. <laughs> I'm hoping that I have power. <laughs> I need it to cook before the power gets taken away from me. It's in book five. God, what's the other bloody angle? Heading back to what used to be home Passing by those little towns I know so well Stopping for gas and then I'm behind the wheel again Driving this like a spiritual plane for every mile I was going to do this 
piece across the top as one piece of wood. Um, however, someone cut the piece of wood 200 mil short, so we're going to have a join. Hence, we're going to put it across there, so from the underside you can never see it. Hopefully, this will fit. Huzzah! Running through emotions high and low, holding on or letting go. I'm fighting another day. Neon lights in the fast lane, life riding high, reaching for the sky. can spot through there. Looks like the uh, locker's done. Cause I've always been told that things will unfold if you keep on waiting. But then you came along and proved me wrong. I was so mistaken. Cause you glue all the pieces back together. Yeah, you, you take all my wrongs and make them better. Yeah, you, you're making me wrong. Not being super used to wood and all, with metal, you don't have to get your angles and your joints absolutely like perfect, you know, half millimetre perfect, because you can just fill it up with a MIG welder. You just, you know, blast some metal on and you're good to go. Um, but that's not the case here. And it's proving to be a bit of pain, actually. Lo and behold. In every spectrum Guess I finally learned my lesson Cause you glue all the pieces back together Yeah, you, you take all my wrongs and make them better Yeah, you, you're making me want to try forever And I feel so free Oh, my sweet baby And I'm thinking out loud We won't need nothing else For the rest of our time And I know it so well I will always be by your side Cause you Grew all the pieces back together Yeah, you You take all my wrongs and make them better Yeah, you Making me wanna try forever I feel so free Oh my sweet baby Done! So that's the um, basic shape of it glued together It's upside down obviously But this is the weird compound curve stuff that was going on So there's like angles that way There's, there's angles sort of that way that makes sense and then you've got angles going on that way so yeah that was fun so our plan now with um, that cabinetry we're gonna uh, wait for all of the glue to dry and then we'll go through and give everything a sand we'll epoxy it um, we're gonna radius off all the internal corners and everything and all of the joins and gaps so that it's gonna be a real beautiful lovely curve on every um, every join and corner uh, and then the whole thing's getting painted this cream color um, two-pack polyurethane which is We've used it before, it's a nice paint, it's really hard, so it's um, nice to be able to clean up, it doesn't hold any dirt and muck and stuff like that. All glued lovely jubbly it's um held together quite nice so i need to go through now and just basically clean up the edges to make sure that they're nice and smooth and not have any manky -ness. um they're not quite flush and there's also gaps you can sort of see there's a bit of a gap just down here i'm not too worried about that because i am going to radius all of these corners so i kind of knew that might happen on these ones because these were pretty difficult to try and get my brain to bend around them same deal with this um the angle wasn't perfect but again it doesn't matter i'm going to be filling all of it and, and fairing it and so on also this surface you don't see this is basically insulation hard up against here um, that's why I wasn't worried about putting a join on this face you don't see it from the um, when I'm finished you won't see it anyway so I've got to flatten all of this down hence these don't quite line up that whole lot gets skimmed down about five mil 
um, just to bring the whole thing down level. So we'll go through and we'll do all of that now. Yeah, and then Jess can start sanding it and we'll get some epoxy on it. gone through and cleaned up the edges they're all flush and lovely enough to start with now we're going to start doing our sanding and finishing but what I have done as you can see here I've done a great big 45 on that corner all the way down same deal along the bottom um, and that's because that edge of this cabinet goes up against steelwork which is welded so there's almost certainly going to be a, a chunky weld in the corner that we have to avoid so that's why we've got a, a 45 there a 45 along the bottom here and then you can see here in the corner we've actually scalloped a big 45 and then this panel starts about maybe five or six mil up from the bottom and that's exactly that to allow for it and then we're going to fill this bottom edge up um, with a bead of sealant once it's into the boat so everything will be radiused and it'll look like it's all one piece it'll look lovely when it's in the boat. Tonight. 